That's a slide, members. So, good morning, members, and welcome to the 88th meeting of the Economy Committee. Some members will be not attending the meeting, by the way. Claire, perhaps. Claire, yeah. I think. So, some members may be attending this morning's meeting via Starleaf, and our witnesses will be briefing via Starleaf. The meeting will be broadcast live when open to the public, and a recording will be made available on the committee's webpage on the Assembly <coughs> website. Just to remind members that any bill briefings will be hand sorted where appropriate, as per protocol, and to ask members to mute their devices when they aren't speaking. So, moving on then to item number one, we have apologies this morning from Keith. Um, and Keith has indicated that, that Peter will his, be his proxy vote should it be required. Um, there aren't any other apologies at the minute. Um, so moving on then to item number two, which is our draft minutes. There is a copy of the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 19th of January at page five of our packs. Are members content that those are an accurate reflection of the meeting? Great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so moving on then to item number three, which is chair's business. There is a clerk's memo on the informal meeting with Anita at page four of table papers. And then there is correspondence from Thompson Travel International on the current concerns from travel agents at page seven of table papers. So Peter, do you want maybe just to give a little update and anybody who was obviously present last week as well? Chair, um, the, the letter from Sharon Thompson, who was at the meeting, is very clear in terms of their experience so far and what they would like to do. They reflected a lot on the, the scheme that was uh, that they had previously from TEO, which I suppose can be summed up as late coming, um, not really the level that was required, and payments being fairly slow. Um, and that those are really issues they need cleared up in um, any new scheme. Stuart um, Dixon had some yeah. thoughts as well. I nominally chaired the meeting um, and um, I think the situation is that we were able to explain to them uh, the and I think the good piece of news that the minister gave us last week which was that he had requested details of the scheme from the executive office so that he could hopefully replicate that now that is good enough and we hope that that transfer is happening and I further uh, written to TEO and asked them have they provided the information because the minister told, told us that he'd requested he hadn't received it at that point in time last Wednesday. However, bearing in mind the correspondence which we've had and the conversation which we had, um, clearly the scheme which TEO rolled out didn't cover all the bases and, and didn't cover all the circumstances. My fear is that the quickest way before the end of the financial year for the economy department to deliver this is just simply to replicate the new scheme. And if they start to finesse it, they will get into all sorts of complications. So I think the expectation might simply be that it will be a replication of the existing scheme. Although the points are well made, and we should write to the department with this correspondence pointing out to them that. Um, if there are opportunities to finesse the scheme uh, to, to take into consideration the points that are made, that, that I'm sure we would encourage to happen. However, um, it may just have to be done quick and dirty at the end of the now at the end of the financial year. In which case, the best that will happen is that we will see a replication of the TU. Chair, the the suggestion was I think the the most common <coughs> allocation under the previous scheme was about ten thousand, irrespective of size. Right. It, it tended to be flat rates. Um, whether you had multiple um, agencies or lots of more employees or whatever, so there was a suggestion of a new flat rate figure. I think that the, the, the average had been about ten thousand. Mm -hmm. There was a suggestion of fifty thousand per agency um, that they had, you know, thought was reasonable for the sorts of losses that they had incurred. And the, the low level of business, I think, you know, a lot reflected they were still only really about 10% of the business they would have had pre-COVID. And a, a lot of the issue now is they're taking deposits for holidays in the future, but those deposits go straight to the holiday company. They don't see anything until um, their, their commission doesn't come until the balance of the holiday is paid. Chair, Mr O'Dowd and Mr Weir were both there as well, and they want to reflect any further. Mr O'Toole? Sorry, Mr O'Toole. Oh, yes. I know. Yeah, no. Look, I, I think that's I think that's a fair summary of what's been um, said. I think part of the issue is, I think we could very much understand the frustration that was there from travel agents, um, and I suppose 
suppose part of the problem is that there's a, a level of tension in terms of if you're looking at funding that uh, realistically there's, there's additional stuff to be done if you're going to hit, as Stuart had indicated, if you're going to hit time frames, then the easiest and quickest way is, is a sort of level of, of replication. Um, and I suppose, given the fact that apart from anything else, that, that one of the levels of frustration when TEO had rolled out funding was the length of time that they took to get funding. Now, again, I suppose uh, there's inevitable tensions we get with any level of funding, um, which is um, given a lot of the public criticism and particularly press criticism that will happen of different government departments, if they rule out funding swiftly and there are then issues around either fraud or quite often more accurately whether there's inappropriate levels of funding and we saw I suppose even across the water the amount of sort of business loans that were have been written off um, on that on that side of it so there is that sort of bit of dilemma in relation to and obviously as well they had raised the issue of, of um, again sort of the nuance of of uh, whether this should be graded according to really the, the size of the business. But again, I suppose the issues, as Stuart indicated, was the more complex you make, the more nuances you put into it, the less likely you're going to get things over the line uh, very quickly on that, on that basis on it. So I suppose that's where the trade-off, I suppose, um, is in connection with that. So um, I assume we will want to share with the department the information that has been provided to us and to actually clarification about where in the process the department is in terms yes. of any potential scheme. Mr. Sorry, Mark, Matthew, go um, ahead. No problem. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was just going to say, I, mean, um, I think I wouldn't disagree with anything that's been said thus far, just that the, I guess emphasising the points around the urgency of the, the situation for some of them, I didn't, um, sincerely, I didn't think that was special pleading. I thought it was, they had very legitimate grievances, mm -hmm. as it were. Um, when compared with the volume of funding that's gone out overall, and the, you know, the the fact that they are as, you know, self-evidently over the last two years have been one of the most devastated sectors. So I thought they made pretty impactful points. There is going to be a, a challenge around. As final point, there is going to be a challenge around getting this, you know, doing a kind of sophisticated means test is going to be a challenge. One of the frustrations they had that was said before is that they, some. You know, they got basically a flat grant. People who had like multiple proper, multiple things, and you know, multiple sites, and, and many employees got the same amount of money as a you know much smaller place with one, one small site. Um, now, th I, you can understand why that would be frustrating. Uh, I suppose at the same time, if if we are advocating, I think we probably should advocate as a, com a committee that something is done before the end of the financial year with the underspend that exists. We we would probably have to be cognizant of the fact that it's not going to be. They probably don't have time to design a really sophisticated scheme that is means tested and um, and, uh, and and unbelievably watertight in that regard. Chair, the, the only other thing that occurred to me just kind of arose a little bit out of the meeting, um, and again, it probably doesn't lie directly to us, but I don't know whether maybe we need to contact the TEO committee. Um, is that one of the things, as I understand it, is that one of the drivers of uh, across the board identifying whether there are executive wide interventions is coming through the COVID task force which is through TEO, and I think there's, a, I'm picking up a little bit of concern that um, the task force in identifying really the priorities or sectors that they feel to be particularly hit don't appear to be giving a particular high level of priority to the travel agents side of things on it. And I, I think the problem is if there's a case, for instance, a package to be made at the executive and the COVID task force isn't, you know, if, if, if for example, I'm, I'm, like, maybe I'm being wrong in this, but if, if effectively the COVID task force attitude at that level is, well, sure, this is a, a sector that's simply coming out of, you know, we don't see a particular need. To, that may itself create a bit of a, a barrier. So I don't know. I, I know that that's not something which lies within our remit, but I don't know if it may be something that we need to flag up with the TEO committee. Just Surely the COVID task force is being informed by all departments and, and you would imagine that the Department for Economy, as being responsible for business, would be making the case for the sectors that they believe are impacted, and therefore we need to correspond with our department uh, directly in respect of that. But also, it would do no harm for yeah, us. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I think it's chair. Yeah, I think that's committee. right. I don't think it's, I don't think it's neither or. If you know what I mean, I think, I think we can take. Um, and and obviously, I suppose as well, TEO who delivered the original scheme 
wouldn't necessarily have the apparatus to deliver a, a business support scheme in the same way, for example, as the Department for Economy would, um, as you know, obviously having agencies that can do that type of thing. Chair, the, the, the big issue they were flagging up, and I think why they had sort of suffered as a sector, was because they were being included in retail. So it was a case of, well, you could open your shop. But that was the other point they were making. The, the constant message was stay at home. Staycation at home. Mm -hmm. Don't travel. Travel's bad. Travel's difficult. Travel's complex. So you can be a travel agent, you can be open. But the, the point they were making was everybody was effectively being told don't travel. So th they weren't then eligible for the likes of furlough and so on, which was a <coughs> massive problem for them. And, and I think the, the sort of final reflection I suppose they had was the amount of debt that a lot of them have racked up for the first time ever, um, largely government backed loans, etc. But the you know, there was a lot of reflection on maybe being third generation businesses, and this was the first time they'd had any substantial debt. So if members are content, um, and the committee then writes to both the minister, supporting uh, the, the Anita position, um, looking for uh, a scheme, appreciating the fact that we are late in the day, and it might just be a case of elevating the scheme that's already there, potentially putting more money into it, and writing to... Um, the Executive Office Committee let them know that, that probably copying them in the letter would be most useful because they've been working on this um, and seeking any urging on their part <coughs> to TEO to move on the data, um, just, just if there can be any pressure applied there, and also flag up the issue of the COVID task force um, to feed back into that, that, that mm -hmm. this sector is not doesn't just fit into retail. It's a bit like some of the other sectors we've seen where they, they don't really fit within that bigger whole. Okay. Members are content that we move on that. I mean, yeah, Chair, I think, I, think that's all, I think the other thing, to be fair, where I think there's been a particular hit for travel aid, I mean, almost most of the other sectors we can think of within Northern Ireland, like whatever the rights and wrongs or whatever restrictions have been there at times on it, have been largely controllable from within, whereas the travel agency side of it is so dependent upon what what is happening both nationally, internationally, and with fairly rapid at times goalpost shifting in that in that regard but given as well that if people for instance are looking to book holidays or trips you know a lot of people will will hang back because there isn't that level of certainty okay um then just another item under chair's business the just to let the committee know that um john has indicated to the clerk that he doesn't intend to schedule a consideration stage for his small-scale green energy bill. John, I don't know if you want to speak to that. Yeah, well, uh, the, the Minister has published his energy strategy and his action plan, and when it's late on detail in terms of small green energy, there is an opportunity there for an incoming Minister to expand on this, and I, I have no intentions of introducing legislation for the sake of introducing legislation. But I, I want to thank the committee members, the clerk and the staff uh, for all the work they put into this. Uh, I think the deliberations have been, I know they've been very interesting. Uh, and if there is a requirement for this bill or the subject we return to the next mandate, I think the foundation work this committee's done is, will be very useful. So thank you to everyone involved. Oh. Um, I just, I'll say uh, to the to the member, well done for being candid about introducing not introducing legislation mm -hmm. for the sake of it. I'm not. A uh, cynic would say there are one or two of our other colleagues across the assembly who. Who, uh, who might benefit from that advice, but I, do, do, yes. I, I wouldn't <laughs> possibly comment. Do, do, I, I take it present no, company no, no, no. is accepted, Mr. O'Toole? Co my do we, do we, vice chair in the All Party Press Group will know that that's, the present company is very much accepted. I strongly support his defamation bill, which is much further in the legislative process. Hopefully, it will be on the statute. Do, do we need to contact all, the Guinness Book of Records? In, in relation before we all break up, that was very much accepted. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, Okay, yeah, sure. members, we'll move on then to item number four, which <coughs> is the departmental briefing on cost <coughs> There's a clerk's memo at page 14 of our packs. There's a letter from the minister regarding the company law common framework at page 19. The draft framework is at page 24. And then there's a letter from the minister regarding the late payment policy common framework at page 31 and the draft framework at page 35. There is a letter from the chair of the common framework scrutiny committee to the minister for energy, clean growth and climate change and the Minister for Small Business, Consumers and Labour Markets at page 49. So can we bring into the spotlight and welcome to the meeting Colin Jack, who's Director of Business and Employment Regulation in DfE, and Alan Scott from International and Economic Relations in DfE. And if I hand over to yourselves then to make an opening statement, and um, we can open up then to members for questions. 
Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm uh, head of uh, business, and business and Employment Regulation Division, and uh, the two common frameworks that have been shared with the committee so far on late payments and company law are in my division's area of responsibility. But I'm aware these are the first two common frameworks that have come in front of the committee. Um, and so Alan Scott, my colleague, has, has joined me because he has an overview of the process uh, in terms of all the common frameworks uh, that affect DFE. Uh, and I thought it might be helpful to the committee for him to give a, a, an overview, first of all, in terms of the process uh, and the rationale for, for common payments. And then I can cover uh, the detail of, of the two that have been shared with the committee to date. Good morning, Chair and members. Um, thanks for the opportunity to present to you today. Um, hopefully, I'm not uh, going over ground that you will already know about, or the likelihood is that you, you will be broadly familiar with the framework's process. But just to provide a reminder of what that involves, um, I'll take you back to uh, shortly after the, the referendum result. Um, the UK government produced a white paper in March 2017 setting out its approach to legislating for exiting the European Union uh, and the conversion into UK law of the ACI, the body of uh, EU law, which would require uh, retention. Um, that white paper, among other things, indicated that the existence of common EU frameworks uh, was an issue in many policy areas. Uh, and some of those policy areas crossed into the remit of devolved administrations. Uh, and that um, the, the white paper indicated really that those uh, EU frameworks had provided a level of stability uh, in terms of policy continuity across the UK, even though technically those were devolved areas. Uh, and the, the view was that, that there should be a level of continuity in those frameworks as the UK left the EU, and there should be uh, th those areas should be. Um, the subject of UK common frameworks to uh, ensure that those policies could be managed uh, in, a, in a level of consistency um, after the powers, the, the Brussels powers were no longer on the statute book. So it was anticipated that uh, common frameworks would be required really to protect the freedom of businesses and citizens to continue to operate across the four UK jurisdictions uh, as a single UK market and to enable the UK uh, to agree future trade deals with other countries. Uh, so you, really, um, the common frameworks were designed as a way of, of managing the possibility of divergence developing across the UK administrations um, without proper consideration. So it's about setting a framework in place, really, to ensure that any measures taken uh, by any of the administrations are fully considered and discussed between them. Uh, and Looking now at the Common Frameworks principles, uh, those were agreed by the Joint Ministerial Committee for European Negotiations uh, in October 2017. And at that time, as we know, there was no functioning executive. Um, so uh, those frameworks at the time were endorsed by the, the Great Britain administrations. Um, when the devolved administration here returned, uh, in 2020, the executive uh, itself endorsed those frameworks principles in June of 2020. So what were the principles? Um, in summary, they were around enabling the functioning of an effective UK internal market. Uh, while acknowledging policy divergence, they were designed to facilitate, as I say, compliance with international obligations, including uh, the ability to reach new trade agreements for the UK government. Um, they were designed to provide cross-jurisdictional access to justice and to safeguard the security of the UK, to respect the devolution settlements. And then interestingly, from our local point of view, there was a, a, a quotation about Northern Ireland, which I think is, is worth reading. Frameworks will ensure recognition of the economic and social linkages um, between Northern Ireland and Ireland and that Northern Ireland will be the only part of the UK that
that shares of land frontier with the EU, they will also adhere to the Belfast Agreement. So I think it's important to recognise that there, there was that uh, acknowledgement of the special position and circumstances of Northern Ireland uh, in, the, in the principles governing the frameworks. So in terms of the frameworks process itself, what is it? It consists of five phases. Um, the first of those phases was, was effectively uh, October 17 to March 18. Uh, establishing the principles and the proof of concept. So um, that involved looking at an initial list of areas of the returning powers coming back from Brussels to the UK. Uh, that list was drawn up and categorised by whether a formal common framework structure would indeed be required. Uh, and that analysis was published in March 2018, with initially over 150 areas of uh, identified that which might require potential frameworks to be put in place. So the second phase then from April 2018 was around initial policy development to see um, what might be done in each of those areas. And then uh, moving on to phase three, that uh, included much more detailed policy development, uh, including relevant stakeholder engagement. So we now find ourselves for the, the two com the, the company law and the, the late payments frameworks, which are under consideration today, we find ourselves at phase four, which is around uh, the scrutiny by the, the, the relevant legislatures, including the committee here today. Um, and that then, the, the objective then is assuming that there is a contentment with the framework as it is or, 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 or pending any changes to it. It would then move to finalisation of the framework and its implementation. And then phase five is around post-implementation arrangements and review to ensure, I suppose, that the framework continues in an appropriate manner uh, in the years to come. So uh, just turning to DFE and what are the frameworks that DFE is concerned with? Um, so those are obviously the two we're looking at today, company law and the payments, but also there are frameworks around specified quantities and packaged goods. That is one that has still to be agreed. There's one around recognition of professional qualifications and around services. Both of those are still under development. Um, and then there's finally one around chemicals and pesticides, which is jointly held between DFE and and DERA, uh, and really I understand from uh, policy colleagues in the department that the committee will will hear shortly, uh, will receive written uh, notification shortly of, of a development on that particular framework, so I won't preempt that. So that is essentially the, the, the broad story of common frameworks and the rationale for them. And if I, if I now hand back to Colin, who can then uh, inform you about the company law and the payments frameworks. Okay, so um, taking the um, com company law uh, framework first, um, this is an area where uh, we in Northern Ireland have for some time maintained parity with uh, GB. Um, the Companies Act 2006 is the, uh, I suppose, fundamental piece of legislation governing uh, company uh, life cycles, so um, you know it, it covers the arrangements for the formation of companies, the, the shareholder relations, uh, the publication and filing requirements, arrangements for audit, uh, and so on. Um, and uh, there has been an agreement for uh, a number of years with the Department for uh, Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, and its. Uh, for runner departments, uh, that uh, that department will legislate for the whole UK on company law, um, and um, uh, although it is a, a devolved matter, um, the the, um, the 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 base will, will bring forward UK wide legislation. However, um, that agreement that has existed for uh, many years. Uh, does make clear that if at some point uh, a devolved Northern Ireland Minister took a decision uh, to uh, do our own thing, um, that uh, would be possible. Uh, but um, I mean, to date, no advantage has been seen in, in developing uh, separate Northern Ireland arrangements. Um, indeed, uh, I mean, there was a change in 2010 in terms of uh, company registration at Companies House. There, there used to be uh, a Northern Ireland uh, specific company's house, 
uh, there's now companies house for the whole UK where, where companies are, are registered, although there is a specific Northern Ireland register within that, uh, and uh, companies, uh, you join the, the, the register in Northern Ireland, or there's a, a Scottish register and an England and Wales register, and then they also uh, can be listed on the central register. Um, so, um, really, uh, there, there have been very good uh, working relationships at official level between uh, DFE and uh, DADI previously and, and BAYS, um, and uh, the common framework really just formalises that um, and introduces some uh, potential dispute resolution mechanisms uh, should there be any problems in, in this area in the future. Uh, that's not something we really envisage at all, but uh, it, it is uh, something that's uh, been put in place uh, and, and it's common to all the, the common frameworks. Um, turning then to the late payment uh, framework, um, it, um, I suppose, originates from the EU Late Payment Directive 2011-7 EU, uh, which introduces a system of um, those uh, compensation and also a right for small businesses particularly, but I think any business um, which uh, has difficulty in securing payments from uh, either the public sector or other businesses uh, for goods and services, um, and it allows or provides for businesses to charge interest uh, where payments are uh, more than uh, 30 days late in terms of those being uh, provided to the public sector uh, and 60 days uh, for uh, the private sector um, and uh, companies can charge uh, a rate of interest which is 8% above uh, under the directive it's the European Central Bank base rate in the UK it has been the, the Bank of England base rate um, and also there is a system of uh, additional charges or I suppose compensation payments uh, depending on the size of the uh, the debt. So it's £40 for a debt of less than £1,000, £70 for a debt of less than £10,000 and £100 for a debt of more than £10,000 uh, and companies have the right to, uh, to, to levy those charges uh, and there are various means by which they can do that. Um, ultimately, it's enforceable through the courts, but uh, clearly there are costs for companies uh, if they want to go down that route. So, I mean, there are various sources of guidance for them in terms of how they would uh, secure those payments. Uh, there's also uh, an office of the Small Business Commissioner uh, who operates UK-wide, and companies having difficulty with this issue, issue can contact the Small Business Commissioner both for advice and indeed to, to have uh, difficulties investigated um, and uh, the current Small Business Commissioner uh, was appointed in July uh, 2021. Uh, her name is Liz Barclay and she actually originally comes from Northern Ireland and she would be keen to uh, engage uh, with uh, stakeholders here in terms of I suppose raising further awareness of the issue and, and making sure that, uh, that the problem of late payments is addressed. Um, so, I mean, that's really, uh, and I suppose in terms of the common framework itself, um, again, um, you know, we've, we've stuck uh, closely to the, the UK-wide position, uh, I suppose, in, in the framework of EU membership, where there was the directive, there, there wasn't much scope to diverge in any event, uh, but certainly um, there has been no indication uh, from the UK government to date that they envisage divergence in, in either of these areas in the short term. Um, so again, there's the, the dispute resolution uh, mechanism set out in the in the framework. So, I mean, that's okay. our presentation, I think, to, to start with. So happy to take any questions from the committee. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I should say, this is uh, the Deputy Chair, Matthew, um, uh, uh, in case you're wondering why uh, the chairperson's voice has suddenly morphed. Um, it's because she's had to pop out to make a speech in uh, the chamber. Um, so thank you both uh, for that, um, both the introduction uh, or the reintroduction uh, around, around the, um, uh, the background to common frameworks uh, and then also 
uh, your specific guidance on the on the two draft late payments and for a draft um, common frameworks in front of us now um, for um, uh, for consideration uh, on late payments and company law. Can I just ask, um, uh, first of all, um, Colin and Alan, these aren't um, these aren't legislative. These are um, agreement. These are intergovernmental agreements. They have no legislative or legal force, as it were. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. And um, they, I mean, they came about by the joint the JMC process, which, as you say, there there, there was no um, uh, executive ministerial input. Was there? Um, civil service input when the institutions were down and, and these were, for, I suppose, these were probably themselves drafted subsequent to the re-establishment of the institutions or were these drafted pre-January 2020? There was um, a development process before the institutions were restored uh, and it was at that point uh, I think that most of the discussion took place about which areas would require common frameworks. Yeah. There have been draft common frameworks in place, but they have been revised recently. So uh, certainly these two have been agreed by ministers since the uh, restoration of the institutions. Okay. Um, one of the things um, that Alan mentioned was that the um, in the initial drafting of the principles for the common frameworks, which, which did happen, I think, at JMC level when there were no institutions here, reference was made to the Good Friday Agreement and um, uh, and, and, and the sort of, uh, presumably there, by extension, the North-South economic context. Can I ask what role that, that principle had in the development of either of these draft frameworks um, uh, on either company law or late payments? Sorry, is it the way you asked the question, I thought you were Sorry. directing that. That's the, the, the politician's way is to ask questions. And pretty, my, my, my question is, on in the development of these draft common frameworks, it, did the um, principle around um, you know, reflecting the unique circumstances of the, of the land border, by which we mean you know, uh, the north-south economy, how did that, how was that reflected uh, in the drafting of these common frameworks? Was that a factor in the drafting or the discussions? I don't think it was a particular factor for these two uh, frameworks. I mean, we, we didn't, uh, I mean, obviously we always have it in mind, but I don't, I don't think we, we saw it as being a particular uh, issue uh, in relation to either of these uh, frameworks. I mean, I suppose if you think about the, the late payment one, there's the overall uh, late payment directive and the regime that applies in uh, continuing EU member states uh, will continue. Um, the, the regime UK is based closely on that EU um, model uh, and at present certainly there's no plan to diverge from that. So um, you know, I suppose you didn't see that as being a, a, a major uh, issue. In terms of, of company law, Again, I mean, I suppose companies always need to be able to operate internationally uh, as well as within mm -hmm. uh, the jurisdiction or previously within uh, the EU. Um, so, um, you know, the, the, I don't think it was a major issue for this particular uh, common framework. So it was. It was. So it sounds like it was the the fact that there's no particularly late payments. I mean, personally, I could see ways in which the Elite payments framework, for example, there will be lots of public and private sector organisations who, who routinely contract from the Republic, um, and uh, and vice versa. Um, uh, what you're saying is because there's no live threat of divergence, that's less of an issue. It's, it's not the, it's not that there isn't relevant economic activity that would be affected by these regulations on a cross-border basis. It's that there's no risk of divergence that you can see at the minute. Yes, then no, that's right. Okay, um, I, hope, I hope that continues, obviously. Uh, one final question before I turn it over to members of the, of the committee is the earlier this week, I think on Tuesday, there was a um, voluminous document published by the UK government on um, uh, um, areas of potential divergence. I'm just wondering, have you, did you have, and that mentions common frameworks, there's a paragraph where it talks about the, the divergence plans having reference to the common frameworks. Did you, did you or your department, I mean, you may not be, you, I appreciate Colin, you won't be able to answer for the whole of DFE, but did you have any 
um, input into that document, or were you aware it was coming? Um, well, I, I certainly hadn't uh, been aware of the document before it was published, um, and I mean, it doesn't make any reference to any specific issues in my divisional area of responsibility. Um, Alan, do you know, was there any other engagement with the department? So I think in, in the broader context, the you know the, the civil servants are looking at that document across on across the departmental basis to to try to tease out what the potential implications would be. And divergence is a very live issue for us, as you know, and um, you know particularly with regard to the likes of the protocol and where, where we will have to follow in certain instances EU law, mm -hmm. and where in Great Britain that is not the case. So um, a lot of the the document I've had a quick scan of it myself, and a lot of it is is, is at quite a level high level aspirational type of approach at this stage. I think we, we need to see a little bit more of the detail before we can make those uh, kind of detailed judgments about the potential implications. But certainly, we're, we're very much alive to the, the potential implications, and we will be continuing to engage with uh, the UK government to try to um, establish what the potential implications are. Right, OK, that's really helpful. Thank you. I'm going to turn over to members. Uh, Mike is first. Yeah. Deputy Chair, thanks. Um, gentlemen, I think this, I've only got one question, and I think it follows on from Matthew's last. Um, Alan, you talked about the, the, the benefit of the acknowledgement of Northern Ireland's special circumstances, but what are the practical outworkings of that uh, in terms of what divergences do you need? Uh, in, in terms of any given policy area, I, I suppose that would be for the relevant policy officials to give an account for that policy area. But I would imagine that, you know, on broad terms, in terms of the broad strokes of it, particularly where we are bound by EU law under the protocol, there will be a need for a particular consideration of what is the, the cross-border relationship here and what would be the implications if GB decides to go down a particular route and if Northern Ireland then is unable to do that, or you know, because the protocol dictates in a certain way that that is not going to be possible, so you know, it, it's that possibility of divergence emerging because of decisions made on in London that are not then replicated for whatever reason in Belfast that could create that divergence over the long term, and so in any particular area. Um, the, the individual policy officials looking at that area would need to consider the impacts of, uh, you know, what will be the implications of that divergence, and would need to, I believe, make representations to their their UK government uh, colleagues and those in the other GB administrations as to the potential impacts on Northern Ireland. So, I'm sorry to give you know such a broad answer to that, but it, I think it'll have to depend very much on the individual policy area and the issues that are at play within that policy area. Yeah, I'm no difficulty with the, with the, the, the breadth of the answer. I suppose that just reflects where we are. And, and am I correct in reflecting then that, you know, a year into the protocol and several years into EU uh, exit, uh, we're still in an era of uncertainty? I think it is fair to say that there's still a level of uncertainty. We, we certainly are aware of the UK government's ambition uh, as it has set out in its, its white paper last year. And we are also aware that th there are ongoing negotiations with the EU. So uh, I think until the outcome of those negotiations is known, it's very difficult for a range of people, uh, you know, including ourselves, including businesses, to plan ahead for, for what the implications might be. So in a way, that, so that uncertainty, unfortunately, continues to prevail until such time as uh, an agreement is reached. That makes sense. Okay. I, I suppose just in relation to um, the question, I mean, I, I suppose I can give a case study from my divisional area of responsibility. I mean, Alan mentioned at the start that there were 152 areas that were considered as part of the process and 32 where common frameworks were regarded as, as necessary. Um, I mean, one of the 152 areas where we don't have a common framework uh, is the aspects of employment law that are EU derived. Um, and I suppose some of the factors that were taken into account in the decision uh, not to have a common framework there were, uh, um, I suppose that there were 
existing good relationships at official level and at ministerial level when we have ministers, uh, but also that there was some existing divergence. Uh, but also, I suppose, that where there is divergence, and I suppose we've seen uh, an example recently through um, the uh, parental bereavement leave and pay bill, for example, um, you know, that probably doesn't have that material and impact on the operation of the the, the single of the, the the UK single market or I suppose broader markets. Uh, you know those are areas of devolved competence where there is an appetite or can be an appetite on the part of the devolved administrations to diverge, but in ways that probably don't uh, materially affect uh, the, the the operation of of the single market or or trade. Okay, thank you both. Okay, thanks, Mike. I don't think there are any other um, uh, questions from members at this stage. I, I did have one um, question, which was uh, specifically in relation to uh, one of the things I, I can't remember whether it was Alan or Colin mentioned it, but <clears throat> you said work was ongoing on regulation of professional services. I presume there will be a particular focus from the department on the um, clearly that the, the east west, but also the north south component to that, given the huge range of kind of uh, issues in terms of mutual recognition of professional qualifications, whether it's healthcare uh, or indeed legal services? Is, that, is there a particular uh, focus in that, uh, on the kind of protecting the North-South uh, MRPQ um, uh, in that regard? Sorry, that was at the end of my question. I didn't finish it properly. Yeah, yes, certainly. Um, just to re reference back to what, what I mentioned, um, in terms of the, there, there are two frameworks under preparation. One is on the mutual recognition of professional qualifications, and the other is on the provision of services. And the two are linked. Um, the, the, the CM officials are, are working on both. Uh, are engaging with uh, UK government counterparts, and indeed, I think uh, there's there's a, there's certainly a significant awareness of the, the, the north south linkages and the importance of uh, people being able to move uh, across these islands in, in terms of you know having the qualifications and be able to move to uh, jobs where they can utilise those. So I think it's worth referring back to the Memorandum of Understanding, which was signed in 2019 by both the UK and Irish governments, which uh, reaffirms that recognition of professional qualifications is an, is an essential facilitator of the right to work. And so people uh, developing those frameworks are well aware of that commitment, uh, uh, as far as I'm aware, are factoring that in to the development of the frameworks. As, as you may know, there's wider developments on the, the recognition of professional qualifications. There's a, a bill currently going through Parliament. So there's a lot going on in that area. And um, I think that when it comes to the consideration of that framework by the committee, uh, the relevant policy officials will be able to give a more fulsome update on, on what the position is with regard to that framework. Okay. That's, uh Really helpful. Thank you um, for you both. I would just briefly ask: Do you know, do you, do you, uh, you you don't know when that those common frameworks are going to be finalised? There's no timeline. It's they're, they're just in in the pipeline. As I understand it, the latest position is that um, the ministerial agreement is being sought to go to go and engage with stakeholders. And following that engagement, it would be the intention to uh, facilitate committee scrutiny. I suppose we're up against the clock, in a sense, in terms of the forthcoming elections, but I think that is certainly the intention. It's just there isn't a specific uh, fixed timescale for that. Okay, that's uh, that's very helpful. And the next steps with these draft common frameworks is that you're engaging with stakeholders on these as we speak? They're yes. On the, on the uh, ones that we were talking about today. But, but I mean, particularly with the committee, yeah. um, the, the, the process was uh, designed in such a way that um, the committees in the various uh, legislatures around the UK was to happen in parallel. So uh, the Webster Committee is, is looking at these as well. Uh, and I'm aware the, the committee here uh, has plans to engage with stakeholders. Okay, that's uh, wonderful. Thank you both. In the absence of any further questions from members, we'll re release you from Spotlight. I know Colin in particular has probably had quite enough time uh, uh, with the Economy Committee over the last month or two, so that you can escape back into the rest of your working day. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Okay, members, um, 
We are, I believe, making contact with the relevant stakeholders. I presume that would include the FSB and people like that. Deputy Chair, yes. Uh, also, we, we've realised that the nature of these common frameworks is such that we're also contacting um, a number of the academics that we've had contact with before who are perhaps more in a position to contextualise. Um, so academics at Queen's, academics at the Ulster Business School and so on, who will be able to provide that more, you know, where does this all fit in? Um, the, the, the concepts are reasonably familiar, but you, you do need to be able to contextualise them. The, the officials have done a, a good job of that, but we, we think we just need that bit of additional support from academics as well as, if you like, you know, chalk face um, stakeholders as well. So operational uh, sectoral representatives, um, the unions and academics were primarily focusing on. Can, can I make two, two suggestions, Ch Ch um, Clark, to add to that? One was, um, I, I think, we're, we're sort of key not to just focus on the local Northern Act, because we obviously are a local assembly, but I wonder if we'd be seeking, uh, for example, um, evidence from for, like, the UK Payments Council, which operates on a UK-wide basis, and they, um, but then also the Centre for Cross-Border Studies, I think might be a, a useful routine. That would be my suggestion, it, just to seek their, the, on both of those, I think they'd give us a kind of, UK-wide view in terms of how, for example, the Payments Council, I think, would be the relevant stakeholder who kind of, and, and, and the Centre for Cross-Border Studies might be able to give a view. They might not have a view on whether there's any North-South interaction. I think um, our counterparts in Scotland and Wales are slightly further on, that they yeah. were party to this during our hiatus, you know, when, when discussions were being had on a, a sort of much more broad level. Um, and I think, from recollection, there have already been reports. We may also want to look at those. Yeah. Um, where we can, you know, ha have a, a look at some of the analysis they've already done and the evidence they've gained, um, and where we, we where we don't have to, we won't reinvent the wheel or duplicate. But certainly, if members are content, then we'll also um, look at getting information and, and evidence from the UK Payments Council and the cross border. Um, and of course, we're there based on the Queen's anyway. So yeah. Okay. okay. We we'll go ahead and do that. Uh, and I should also point out to members that. Um, we're also commissioning briefings from RIAs. Yes, and that, I, I understand, is in training. We do have um, hopeful indicative scheduling for that, so that, that is on its way in the next few weeks. Um, as has been indicated by officials, this, like everything else we're doing at the minute, is a super condensed process uh, and, and therefore never ideal, but we are trying to get as much evidence together as possible to compose a committee response. Um, and obviously we will publish that uh, and anything we get from our stakeholders but um, time is short and I gather we are also expecting legislation coming, additional legislation that we didn't think would get as far as it is. Great, thank you Clark. Um, uh, if we move on then to agenda item 5 which is um, matters arising, are there a number of bits of uh, the number of matters arising including correspondence um, uh, the first to consider is um, correspondence from the Minister at page 53 regarding uh, the proposed remedy payments, which we've discussed here. We discussed with the Minister when he was with us um, for the High Street Voucher Scheme. So, um, uh, as the letter says, members, um, uh, payment for those who are eligible, the, the remedy payment for those uh, who are eligible will be equal to the balance uh, on the card, and it will be uh, paid to them, made via a BACS um, payment. Uh, the proposals for the um, remedy payments have been approved by the Department of Finance and they will be financed uh, via the budget that was, uh, I presume, already allocated to the High Street uh, scheme rather than um, uh, any additional money. The cost of the remedy payments is estimated to be in the region of uh, $1.5 million. <coughs> Departmental officials are currently working uh, on how the scheme will operate and will update uh, the committee when decisions have been made. I, I presume when the working on how the scheme will operate is finding out how they will get establish who the people are who are due to remedy payments and get their bank details in a secure and fraud proof way that's uh, that's that's essentially what they'd be working on now is as you say, doing that in a compliant way um, if they want to make that direct backs payment they have to be very careful about how that's done um, so it's likely to be potentially another application process mm -hmm. they know who the people are but they, they also now need to gather, I guess, more data. The webinar this afternoon, the link for that, which is, is live, is on page 12 of your 
table park if you want to use that. You should also have had the correspondence direct, um, I think via business office. If not, that link is live on page 12 of your table pack. If there's any issue around that, let us know and we will, we will reissue that um, link anyway. Okay, thank you. Um, we have, um, uh, 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 and also um, members. Oh, chair, sorry. Sorry, well, sorry, sorry, sorry Claire. Behind you. Yeah, very much so. <laughs> Enough part um, of my here. I suppose I'm still not satisfied in how the scheme was administered generally. And I wondered if the committee would be minded to perhaps write to even the Equality Commissioner or the Commissioner for Older People just to take their view on how it was administered. Um, you know, I suppose what I'm a bit concerned about in relation to this remedy scheme, and I do appreciate it, is that it doesn't include those people who were not verified. And there are legitimate digital reasons for that. And I suppose really what I'm saying is that there was a significant amount of people that I believe have been excluded from the scheme because of how it was administered. And again, I appreciate that the department says that they did a phone line and all of that, but in my experience from a constituency level, that wasn't accessible. Yeah, okay. um, so, you know, I, I think generally I appreciate it's a one-off scheme, but I, I would be keen to see you know, certainly from a scrutiny perspective and an evaluation of this scheme, you know, if, if the committee was minded to write to those various people that would have a view on that. Uh, personally, I would uh, endorse that, but can I open it up to others? So just to double check, um, Claire, your suggestion is that we write to the Commissioner for Older People and the Equality Commission. Um, uh, certainly, I'd be supportive of that. Can I open that up to others with a view? Sure. Apologies for missing the substance of, of the debate, but I'd raised this at a previous occasion, and it follows on, I think Claire's suggestion to write to the Older People's Commission is a very good one, because... A number of older people have come to me and have been turned down because they didn't respond to emails. They wouldn't use an email from one year to the next. So it goes back to the point I've raised also previously. If a property quality impact assessment had been carried out on the policy and processes, it may well have identified that as being an issue at an early stage. Um, I think that's a, that's a fair point. I mean, if, if any members of any object, although I think we're... Are we in agreement then that we're going to write to those two stakeholders? Sure, I mean, to I, I, I'm happy... Uh, sorry, yeah, I'm happy... I have no particular problem with writing to those. I mean, I think I'll probably make a couple of points. If we're talking about, um, I think there was a, there's was there been a level of trying to ensure that the scheme was up and running and on the ground as quickly as possible. And I think that does put it in a slightly different sphere of things. And I would probably make the, the general point, if you take a look at what the overall level of spend, it, it does suggest that the vast majority of, of people were actually facilitated and indeed, those who missed out directly were, were, were relatively small in terms of in terms of numbers. There's maybe a broader bit, which is um, maybe useful just also to find out, broadly speaking, from the department. Um, do they have any mechanisms for evaluation themselves in terms of the, the scheme? On that basis, maybe that may be worth finding out. But I think, uh, while I think people can point out where problems have arisen, I think you know we should uh, acknowledge the. the scope and scale of this um, as well, which I think in terms of the the, the number of people within Northern Ireland who are able to benefit from this, um, I think in terms of the rollout of that was probably greater than possibly has happened to any other scheme anywhere in the history of Northern Ireland as, as well on it. So I think just we need to put that little bit of context in that side of it as well. Okay. We, we are aware that the department is doing an evaluation. The minister had referenced it um, when he was in last week, and it, it is something we talked about previously the data that it, it would um, realise in terms of where money was spent, how it was spent, levels of spend, you know, there'd be a lot of analysis coming out of that. And the, the assumption, I think, or the, the suggestion also appeared to be that there would be a full post-project um, evaluation of how everything worked and so on. So that it might be helpful to, to seek uh, confirmation of that. Yeah, it's maybe just get yeah. a wee bit of meat on the bones. Yeah, that, yeah. that was the question I was going to ask. Actually, Clark, was do, do and we've talked about it before, and I've raised the question about disaggregated data. data. Yeah, and 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 we have a, a more generalised commitment to get a, some kind of dashboard, but we haven't got a commitment that we're going to get. The department now has all the data. Previously, a large part of the data was held by the the company. Yeah. So the, the department now has ownership of that. My understanding is that's how, how the department is taking forward the remedy. The company that did the cards has, has now effectively fulfilled their commission. So now it's the department um, who, who owns all the data or is using all the data. And I'm assuming that's part of their um, processes then disag disaggregating that. Along the lines that were discussed you know, a number of times when officials came to brief the committee mm. that they would be doing that. But we can clarify just yeah. exactly how that's working and what the time scale is. Yeah, on and what they're planning. I think it would be helpful to understand what exactly they're going to, what they are planning to send to us, 
and what we've asked asked them for yeah. in the past, uh, consistent with what Peter's just said. That I mean, I yeah. um, getting an update on all, on all those things is is, is helpful, and, and definitely there's there's n no doubting that there's a scheme at scale. I don't think that um, is is in doubt. If it doesn't say uh, sort of excuse us from 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 sh from scrutinising it on the question of email, I certainly uh, would endorse what uh, John O'Dowd said, having had um, an older constituent and also my mum look at me funny when I asked whether they checked their spam. <laughs> from the department. Um, anyway, uh, okay. Sure, I was just Sorry. thinking, I mean, beyond, I feel like, the, the scope directly of the scheme itself, presumably the, the data, when it's produced, could have quite interesting spin-offs as well in terms of information. So, for example, I mean, I know, to some extent, if, if you're given a specific amount to spend, it, it may well be sort of almost the, the biggest single survey of, of consumer behaviour that's there. So, you know, Issues around, for example, you know, where do people spend? What's their, what do they see? Even just down to the, I mean, I don't know to what extent they'll have the information to drill down into this, but, you know, we're aware of challenges that are there sometimes between out-of-town retail, high street retail, and I appreciate uh, this is sort of kind of specific in that regard, but I, I think there may well be a lot of data that produce things which, which may give us a certain level of... of detailed economic picture which goes simply beyond just what, what has happened specifically within the scheme. It, will it may, may sort of, in the broadest level, it inform future sort of policy and intervention. It, it'll be useful in a lot of contexts. It's obviously the biggest tracking spend outside what the banks themselves can do yeah. and what the likes of the, the big um, supermarkets do. Obviously, you know, they know how much of everything you buy and, and tilt you in particular directions and reshuffle their shelves according to the spend from different people at different times of the day and all sorts. So there should be a huge amount of data mineable there. Yeah, th there'll be a huge amount of data, but I'm not sure how reflective it will be of typical spends. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, there, there will be a certain level of caveat. I, I, yeah. I, 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 I agree with that, but I'm just... I wanted my 100 to go to a food bank. But they used it fifty pounds for a butcher's and fifty pounds mm. for a toy shop, because they wanted that as Christmas gifts. Yeah. So you won't know that that hundred pounds went to the food bank and art. I, I suspect that general consumer spend may not be as quite as altruistic as yourself. Well, I think what this is. Yeah, but, but but will it have been on something that people wouldn't normally have? Yeah. Spend a hundred pounds on. Indeed. Okay. I think that I, I think what we're. Um, what this discussion is highlighting is that there is, uh, it's important to get this information and uh, and it will be uh, useful both in assessing the uh, success or, or of the scheme or otherwise um, uh, and um, and also actually have useful, it may have, uh, have useful uh, and rich information for other uh, purposes afterwards. So we'll, we'll write to the department and also, um, as Claire Sorkin suggested, to the Commissioner for Older People and the Equality Commission. Did you want to come back in, Claire? Um, no, it was just really to clarify that we were yeah. going yeah. to do yes. that. And I don't detract as well from um, the success of the scheme. And in fairness, I put that on record with the Minister. However, I think that the valuation is important. And I think even to, 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 to add on to Mike's point in relation to that, this was a very specific scheme which directed people on how to spend their money insofar as it was spend local. The marketing around it was very specific in relation to that. I do actually think there's opportunities to look to see how we can reinvigorate high streets because of this scheme. You know, so the, I, th I think there will be information to an extent which will be useful um, for, for future projects, not necessarily something similar to this, but you know, how people do spend their money and maybe you know, has there been success in that it wasn't just about getting someone to spend £100 that was gifted to them. Will they go back to that shop that they previously hadn't, you know, shopped in before because it's now been opened up to them as an opportunity, if you like? So, I, I would really like to see the real value of the scheme. It wasn't just about putting money into the economy. To me, it was about stimulating the high street, um, and you know, to me, that will be the success of it. But again, with all public sector schemes, particularly a one that's as universal as this one, we have to ensure that the accessibility is right. And you know, digital first schemes is the way of the world, and it's why we're going. But you know. We, our, our own systems are not conducive to that and how we support people in relation to older people perhaps who maybe wouldn't be as useful to that. So it's, it's a learning experience, I suppose, is what I'm suggesting. Um, and it's all good. Chair, is there some value in asking the department if, I'm just picking up on, on what Ms. Sugden has said, in subsequent surveying, like obviously there's post-project evaluations of, of what we did, how we did it, administration and so on, but just picking up on that issue of 
One of the things the department indicated was that a key hope was that it would redirect people back to the high street and off, you know, buying online. Yeah. And I, I just wonder, is that being tracked through surveys? Because you obviously now have, what, 1.4 million people who have used this card. So, so, I, so I, I, I'm a, I think that if one of the things we're asking about is are you disaggregating and giving us the rich merchant code data so we know yeah. where the money was, the literal hundred pounds was spent, i.e. was it spent in Tesco or in Miss, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Smith's on the high street, um, then the next point we're asking for is there a plan to do more survey data afterwards in order to see is there a medium term follow through in terms of consumer behaviour um, I, I, I think that makes sense if people are, are content with that. And, and um, I think, I mean, because I think the data would probably just produce a certain level of quantitative bit. But I suppose it's then that can be used to stimulate yeah, a attitude, qualitative. Attitude, um, no. Yes, yeah, yeah, very much so. I think that's that's, that's a reasonable point, point. You know, of well, you know, such and such shop. Well, it's been years since yeah. they've been in that particular bit. Suddenly realise actually there's a range of things. Yeah. You know, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Going impact. It, it, it might also be worth, depending on the response that comes on that putting that into the legacy report as, as a almost a micro inquiry a subsequent committee could do. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I think um, that makes sense. We, we now have capability for, for large-scale surveying on citizen space. Yeah, I think that's really um, important. I mean, I think this is um, definitely, like, this is a, uh, was it quite a big economic experiment? I actually spoke to an economics correspondent uh, from a, a newspaper in London, and, you know, he sort of acknowledges quite, and, like, and I have both spoken in favour of some of the parts of it and been critical and, uh, and, and are inquisitive about other parts of it. But whatever your views on the, on the rights or wrongs of the scheme of the way it's delivered, it is definitely an economic experiment that, w that will provide evidence that will be useful probably even further beyond just here. And I'm sure there will probably be uh, PhDs done on it for <laughs> good or ill. Um, okay. Members are content with that. We're ready for the department quite rich information, for quite detailed information to try and um, follow up. And then also the Commissioner for Older People and the Equality Commission. Um, uh, moving on, uh, uh, item 5.2 um, is a response. It's on page 55. It's a response from the department regarding the disability specialist support contract within the old Training for Success contract. Members, in recent years, there has been an unprecedented increase in demand for support via DSS to help manage this a new referral process was implemented in August 2021 which meant that all requests for new support or an increase in support for existing participants uh, required departmental review or uh, departmental review and approval prior to support commencing the implementation of this process has led to some unavoidable delays in payment primarily uh, due to lack of appropriate information being provided alongside um, services so if members are um, Content to note, uh, that no, is at uh, page uh, 55 and 56. Um, if anyone wants to raise. Uh, uh, next we have um, at page 57, correspondence from the DALO regarding the revocation of the insolvency practitioners um, uh, order. Uh, I should probably give it a full title, insolvency practitioners, brackets, recognised professional bodies, brackets, revocation of recognition order, uh, Northern Ireland 2021. Uh, that's at page 57. Uh, and the introduction of um, the insolvency of practitioners, uh, brackets recognition of profe recognized professional bodies brackets recognition of uh, revocation of recognition a lot of R's in this um, <laughs> item order Northern Ireland 2022 uh, which is at page 17 of tabled papers uh, members the 2021 order still allowed association of certified accountants as having the right to authorize insolvency practitioners the association uh, informed the department on 23rd December 2021 that it wished to have an order made to revoke its, rec its recognition to authorise uh, insolvency practitioners. Um, the 2022 order uh, invokes this request. It invokes the revocation, uh, the revocation order, which will be made under Article 350N of the Insolvency Northern Ireland Order 1989, does not have to be laid at the Assembly. No local insolvency practitioners are licensed by ACCA, therefore rec revocation will have no impact on the profession. Can I just ask out of interest, Clark, do we know why they wanted it revoked? Uh, if you have the power to do it, people can come and ask you to do it. They don't, they don't want to do it and they, they don't want to be seen to be able to do it either. The don't ask, don't revoke policy is what they want. Okay, so it's just for members to note, Point uh, 5.4 uh, is a um, uh, marshal list of uh, amendments uh, for the... Uh, Parental leave uh, and pay bill at point five point four. Um, a page sixty. 
Is that right? So that's the list of amendments which we have agreed. At yes, that's just really for a final record. For yeah. Members. Okay. So that's what we what we what we agreed after our session. We'll all be um, glad, I think, to debate that final stage and hopefully get it on the statute book after lots of hard work, including from um, committee staff. Uh, point five. Point five is um, correspondence from uh, the uh, NIA, NIUSE uh, at, uh, regarding concerns on the future of employment provision. That is at page 71. Members, one of the actions from last week's meeting was to write to the Minister, uh, the Finance Minister and the Department for Leveling Up uh, following the informal meeting with organisations seeking match funding for ESF project. Um, uh, NIUSE uh, has been in touch um, uh, has been has made aware of the meeting um, uh, and the attendance of disability action. So uh, I think that's to note. Chair, it is, yeah. yes. We, we've already dispatched those letters um, and I, I was in direct contact with Edith Dunlop um, about what we'd done. It was essentially, she'd heard about the meeting, we just wanted to make sure that there had been um, disability uh, group input. Um, we, we also have a long-standing promise to go and visit NIUs as well, so that will continue into our legacy report. Um, the, the committee had adopted over a period of time uh, a tradition of going annually, uh, which we've never really been able to do in the economy committee. The, the predecessor committee, Daddy, used to go every year. So um, we, we have that close contact, but as I said, I've been in contact directly with Edith uh, and let her know just how that meeting went. Okay. Um, uh, members at point through, um, oh, sorry, well, we will. 5.6, my apologies. Uh, 5.6 5 at page 10 of tabled papers is correspondence from the Minister regarding the insolvency rules, Northern Ireland, uh, met, the, the insolvency amendment rules, Northern Ireland 2022. As I say, that's at page 10 of tabled papers. Members, these rules provide permanent procedural rules for the company moratorium procedure in the insolvency Northern Ireland uh, order 1989. And that's just for members to note. Uh, Point five point seven is a, an invitation to attend a webinar hosted by departmental officials in which they will set out the process for administering, administering the remedy payments for the HSS scheme. Uh, that's at page 12 of tabled papers, and we've already discussed that. Um, so your link is. So that's the link for the, um, for the webinar. Uh, 5.8 uh, is a response from the DALO at the Department of Finance regarding H&A mechanical services. Uh, the letter is at page 13 uh, of your table papers. Members, the, um, the new engineering and construction contract used by public bodies here contains an optional clause X1 for price adjustment for inflation. Clause X1 may be used to deal with the impact of inflation on a number of cost elements, such as labour, plant, equipment, fuel, etc., as defined by the department within the contract. The Procurement Board has developed a policy proposal to mandate the use of the latest NEC4 contract in infrastructure projects on the 1st of April 2022. The policy will mandate the inclusion of Clause X1 in all contracts. Uh, the Executive will be asked to endorse this policy following the Procurement Board meeting on 2nd of February 2022, i.e. today. So um, uh, can I seek members' agreement to forward that uh, response to the response that we've got from the Department of Finance to H&A Mechanical Services Limited? Eight. We're in agreement. 5.9 is Hansard for committee deliberations uh, of the small scale green energy bill from 26th of um, uh, January 2022. That is somewhat academic now, but given what we've heard from the bill sponsor, that's at page 15 table papers, but hopefully will still be useful for those who are progressing this policy. Don't know the historical bill document. It's a very important <laughs> historical document. Hopefully it'll be. Um, it'll be it will be hopefully not too historic if we, there's progress in the policy area and the new mandate. That's for members to note. Uh, now, agenda item six is the independent review of Invest NI. So, if I could um, direct members to the correspondence from um, Sir Michael Lyons, which is at page um, 91, and uh, the letter from the minister regarding the independent review, uh, which is at page 19 of tabled papers. The terms of reference for the review of Invest NI is at page uh, 21 uh, of the tabled papers. Uh, members, Sir Michael Lyons is, um, uh, he is, as we know, leading the independent review into Invest NI. Uh, Sir Michael is eager to meet with the committee as soon as is practicable. So um, open to seeking members' views on how we uh, proceed. I presume there will be 
unanimity that we will meet Sir Michael Lyons. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. is that, does anybody else have any comments to make on either the terms of reference or the correspondence? Well, on the Mike. terms of reference um, allows the Minister to appoint a panel. So Sir Michael and up to three others. So it would be interesting to know where, where we stand in terms of further appointments. Okay. We, I presume we can ask the department we'll to ask, you, ask the DAL. It, it might be useful to, to do both asking the DALO, but also in a response to Sir Michael, um, yeah. hearing about who he thinks is on his panel. And so it's always useful to get yeah. a response from the people themselves. The sources as well. You may not know all of the... Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, has, has he been consulted? Has he been asked? Um, so, um, uh, so presumably we are, uh, members are um, uh, content for us to respond to Sir Michael. Um, uh, to, uh, to, to explore potential dates? What, what, we, what we might also do, Chair, is, um, as well as dates, also just um, try and get an idea of how he would like to do that. The assumption would be, because it's a review, it'll not be an open session. Uh, that will be for the publication of the review and a subsequent committee, obviously looking at that and wanting to talk to Sir Michael around what it is he comes out with. So what we'll probably try and do is, is pin it to a Wednesday to make it a bit easier to, to get everybody there, and we'll do a closed session with them. Um, depends on how that goes, what the committee wants to then do subsequently, but also uh, it might be worth finding out from Sir Michael how he wants to do any kind of party engagement as well. Yeah. So, so on the party engagement point, I, I presume he will be, um, uh, that will be something, he, he, well, he may be amenable to it, but I don't know if that's, it's not specifically referenced in the terms of reference. It's not. Um, in the Fiscal Commission, as a, an example, which has a slightly bit wider remit, but is, I suppose, comparable, has taken evidence, has met with all the political parties and has taken, uh, I think, uh, evidence from them on a, on a party basis. So. Um, I, I, uh, I, I suppose it would be on the basis of, you know, this is a, this is a review of efficiency function and so on, and obviously that the party input would be reflective of the fact that we obviously at this stage don't know who an incoming economy minister might be. Um, therefore, you would assume that Sir Michael would want to seek a range of views from across all the parties. To to make an appropriate judgment on on the review, so that it, it won't be likely to be jarringly um, different to, to what an incoming minister might want. Yeah. 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 Chair, I, I, I one one of the three, the three tests is whether the function, I invest in I, is delivering with absolute political impartiality. So to, to make an assessment of that test, you would imagine he would want to seek whether political parties believe it's being delivered impartially. Okay. Peter? Yeah, I just, just think there's a small practical uh, consideration, I think, in terms of facilitation. If we're getting uh, Sir Michael on a Wednesday, I don't know, maybe it might be useful to almost set up a session, and I appreciate this maybe easier for some of us who are closer to hand than, than others, but maybe to do have him scheduled in for like a half nine to half ten. One of the things I'm just conscious of as we move closer towards the end of mandate is that the sort of circumstances that we have today of business from plenary spilling over into the Wednesday and presumably taking a few of the members out of the picture. Just, uh, let me put it this way, and I entirely understand where the, the range of reasons why various members will have to be in the chamber. I think if we're getting Sir Michael here, it doesn't look all that good if we're going to end up potentially with half the members in and half out because they're having to, to juggle that. Yeah. If, if at least we had a sort of a half nine to half ten scheduled or whatever day um, that is, it means hopefully we should be able to do that without there being necessarily the same level of disruption. Okay. We can move on that, yeah. I, I, that that seems reasonable to me. Anyone else have any comments to make on the... Okay, and we, we don't actually know yet when we're going to have Sir Michael, but we're no, no, we, we, we need to just see soon, what sort of availability he has. Obviously, we'll be doing it online anyway. Um, this is a balance between him. Doing, if you do it immediately, yeah. he won't have... Yeah. He, the, the evidence session might not be... Okay, um, so we will respond to Sir Michael as per our discussion and... Um, uh, uh, seek his views on timing, pr practicalities, uh, and modalities. Is it? Would it be in order, Clark? Could you advise for us to seek clarity on whether he's engaging with political parties in uh, our letter? Uh, that would seem. To, I don't think we're we're not actually we're not with members here from many parties, so we can't be accused of asking on the basis of one party. Oh, well, absolutely. The, okay. I think that's just getting that clarification so that that can start to be set up. Obviously. Um, 
the, the report doesn't come until September. However, he will be making an interim update to the Minister in April. With dissolution hurtling, uh, trying to get hold of, of um, representatives from parties in the next couple of months may well become complex. So pinning down if, he, if he's going to be doing that quickly and getting arrangements in train would probably be worthwhile. Um, they don't just copy and paste the relevant bits of their manifestos, but anyway... Yeah. I'm, I'm going to do that, by the way. So cynical for one so young. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not so young. No, a, no. A, any incoming minister may also wish for the review to be broadened, extended. So there may be, this not maybe the end of the story yet. And, and, and I suppose that obviously comes from um, Sir Michael's angle as well, if he feels that there's a requirement. You know, members will have experienced many times in terms of reference of a committee inquiry, flexing and changing. Mm -hmm. As you move in and you get more evidence, you find your terms of reference isn't always what you needed it to be, etc. So I'm assuming as part of his April update to the Minister, that would be something he'd reflect on. And ultimately, if the report's kind of gauged for September, no one knows who the Minister's likely to be. There'll be a new committee. Um, and, and the landscape may well have changed significantly in, in other ways. Hopefully, we'll be able to say it's post-COVID, um, and, and that may also create new things happening. Um, it's also probably very important members bear in mind that this is part of um, a universal arms-length body review that has been agreed by the executive. Um, all arm's length bodies will be reviewed. This was done previously prior to the departmental changes in 2016. My recollection then was not many departments actually did a full review of all arm's length bodies. A couple did. Um, but this will mean that the likes of um, Tourism NI and, and all the other arm's length bodies that the department has will also have to go through a review process if, as the Minister then you know, has set out, this is part of that wider process. So I suppose that's something also to gauge is what's the time scale for all of that? That, that was an NDNA commitment as yeah. well, was it not? Yeah. So it, it, it's relatively normal practice. It is it's five years plus since we did it the last time, more than five years, well over five years. So I suppose it's also trying to find out what exactly is going to be happening with that. Okay. Mm -hmm. We can... I think we're agreed on our action to write to Sir Michael and, and proceed. Thank you. Um, if, if we're all content with that, we'll move on to agenda item seven, which is the domestic abuse uh, bracket safe leave bill. Uh, the um, uh, report on the draft domestic abuse bracket safe leave bill is at page 93 of your pack. Um, Hansard of formal clause by clause consideration of the bill is at page 28 of the tabled papers. Uh, members, uh, the committee will now consider a draft committee report uh, of the, on the domestic uh, abuse bracket safe leave bill, which, as I say, is at um, page 93. Uh, members, the page numbers uh, referred to may change due to reformatting. Uh, the report on the delegated powers within the bill has been received from the examiner of statutory rules. The examiner has indicated that she is content with the delegated powers contained uh, in the bill. A line will be added to the report to reflect this. So, uh, we can just also flag up, yes. uh, and I forwarded it to members, um, a response from the department uh, on the bill, which incorporates the response Mr Nesbitt got on commencement. So it's, it's literally, his, his commencement is, is identical in this letter, and then it, it expands out. So it's uh, indicating the department's view um, and issues potentially around the likes of commencement and so on. So... Because that has arrived now and we have it and members are, are getting it, um, what we'd look to do is reflect it. It needs to be incorporated into the report, so it will be published along with the report. But um, what we'll also need to do is get members to agree that we reflect it briefly, a couple of lines within the, the report itself. Um, but it's just to say that arrived subsequent to this being okay. um, drafted. So we'll need to, we should agree that today? Then, yes, as well. please, okay. if we can. Mike? It might be useful just to say that um, Stuart Dixon and I met the bill sponsor briefly on Monday uh, about the commencement and the fact she was leaving discretion to the department. Mm -hmm. So then uh, I'm not going to rehearse the conversation, bar she said she'd had no engagement from the department. So I emailed private office and got a response, uh, which I picked up at 5 to 10 this morning. The department are basically saying, because it's a private member's bill, we haven't scoped this out. 
uh, when we do scope it out, if there's a problem, if you put a commencement date in, that may compound the problem. Okay. So I'm reading it as saying they, they are not in favour okay. of you know, two years after oil ascent. Okay. I, I suppose potentially if you compare that to parental bereavement, leave and pay chair, um, they scoped that and, and were able to scope the committee's amendments and that was yeah. what allowed us to put dates on it. That work hasn't been done for this, mm. um, and, and officials have reflected that in the comments they've made that you know uh, this work would have been taken forward by the department as as part of earlier discussions around doing this, but obviously COVID and, and other things have intervened. So I, I suspect that's a key part of what the department's saying is there is no scoping done on this, <coughs> therefore they can't even pitch a date, if you like. So yeah. They're even saying that they they can't take a what is a relatively discreet bill they can't even say but within we are confident that we can scope and therefore commence this within two years or okay i Seems suppose the other thing they're reflecting chair is the um the delicacy and sensitivity around this um this isn't a straight uh, it's not a straightforward bill i think in in an economy such as ours with so many micro businesses um, family-run micro-businesses. There are added complexities here that the regulations will really, really need to understand and pin down. It's one thing for a specific company to have a policy, as, as we've seen before. We, we know that a number have. But to get something that's fit for purpose across an entire sector like that would be... It requires a huge amount of delicacy. So I... You know, the, the committee is, is and always has been very clear on the need for commencements, but I suppose in this context, um, I, I would stand behind some of what the department has said in terms of the advice I give the committee. Um, in the, the level of scoping required just isn't there at the moment. And, you know, the, the level of engagement required to get this right and make it applicable across sectors is going to be fairly difficult and technical but that you know it's up to the committee as to what they what they want to do okay well i think it's now time for me to hand back to the actual chair we just chair been having a discussion about before we got into the formal discussion of the committee report we've been having a discussion about a response from the department which isn't contained because it's just the clerk just received it the com the uh, department's view is that it is not possible to provide a commencement date or agree a commencement date and that chimes with the discussion that Mike Nesbitt and Stuart Dixon had because in, um, not enough, uh, even the most basic uh, work has been done to scope the bill um, so they're, they're very cautious about a commencement date and that was what we were just discussing and the clerk was reflecting. So Chair, um, as, as indicated, we'll, um, we can reflect that response and republish it with our, our bill report. And it's really just at the end of, of the process we have here, if we just get agreement to do that. Okay. So we move so we start then, then yeah, if bottom to, of page seven. Uh, refer members to the title page, the table of contents, the committee powers and membership at pages 94 to 97 of our packs. Are members content with this section as drafted? Content. Thank you. Content. Okay. So then moving on to the executive summary, which is paragraphs uh, 1 to 9 of pages 98 and 99. So are members content with this section as drafted? Mm. Chair, that's going to be a, a section we will add a line in about having received a departmental response if members are content. Sorry, department response on commencement. The one we've just had. It, it's wider than that. If, if, you, if you have a look executive at the... the it lifts um, the response made to Mr Nesbitt. Is, is part of that letter, but there's more as well. There's more commentary on the wider right. bill. So it's just reflecting the fact we've received that and it'll be part of the publication. Okay. Will that be a separate paragraph then? Or will it yeah, it'll be an additional paragraph that's going to throw all our paragraphs out. But Sorry about it'll that. Add, no, no, it's, it's fine. Getting a response is, is good. It'll just mean everything. We'll now go down one um, just to complicate everything. Okay. So moving on then to the introduction and committee approach at paragraphs 10 to 27, which are pages 100 to 103. Are members content with this section as drafted? Thank you. Okay. 
and then the members consideration of the bill is at paragraphs 28 to 69 um, of pages 104 to 112 our members sorry chair we'll also insert a line there indicating that the committee has had a response from the department and that this morning there was brief discussion on it okay so that will really nothing more than that so that'll insert there that as well one. yes so that'll push paragraphs further down okay so members content then with that section subject to the amendment okay um so moving on then to um other issues raised in the consideration of the bill a paragraph 70 to 71 on page 113 are members content with that section chair again we'll add a line reflecting the discussion around commencement that's been had as well okay then this one won't need changed. Clause by clause is at page 114. Are Stand members back. content with this section? Mm -hmm. And then the appendices 1 to 7 at pages 115 to 121. And again, this letter will also be included in that, Chair. Okay. So, subject to that addition, are members content? Content. Thank you. Okay. So, that's the committee report. Agreed? We will look to publish that with a fair wind on, I'm going to say, Friday. I'm going to say Friday, I'm getting nodding for that. So that will go out to all members on Friday through the, um, the, the shared drive thing. One, one drive, one share. We know what you're talking about. That one, that, that one. Computer thing. The computer, computer thing. thing. <laughs> no, that will go out. Um, the, the, pigeons, the pigeons will be released from their... <laughs> their pigeons, yeah, I can remember when we still put it in the pigeonholes. Yeah. Um, so that'll go out on Friday. It also means we can let the... Um, although we pretty much confirmed with the sponsor that that would be the date, so we can confirm with our... The committee has concluded and the bill, will be, bill report will be published. Okay. Okay, so then moving on to item number eight, which is the Employment Zero Hours and Banded Weekly Working Hours Bill. Um, there's a clerk's memo at page 33 of table papers. The bill as introduced at page 36 of table papers. The explanatory and financial memorandum at page 52 of table papers. Provisional timetable for the bill at page 64 of table papers. A sign posting notice at page 66. Motion to extend committee stage to the 21st of March at page 67. Then there are draft survey questions at page 68. Correspondence from the Bill Office regarding the committee stage of the Bill at page 70 um, and the Hansard for the committee discussion of the Bill um, on the 26th of January at page 71, all of those in table papers obviously. So the Bill was introduced on the 17th of November and it passed its second stage on Monday past. Um, the committee has got 30 working days to take evidence, consider and report its opinion on the bill. So that 30 day period would end on Monday the 14th of March. It's advised the committee seeks extension to extend the committee stage by just the one week given the tight time frame before dissolution and a motion request and this must be considered in plenary before the end of the 30 day period. So given the limited time, the motion to extend the committee stage is being considered today um, with an expected date for plenary as soon as possible. So the draft timeline included outlines the extension to the 21st of March. So are members happy enough with the draft timeline? And it's and super tight and, and we would not do this unless dissolution was the following week. You know, the committee, it is difficult to turn around a bill at this speed, but Again, because we know the bill can't proceed beyond committee stage, this will be a gathering of evidence to be set in front of the Assembly um, probably in the next mandate if the bill is then brought forward again. Yeah, I mean, Chair, I think, the, I got, I think that's right. I think I suspect that that may also give some level of indication to our committee report on the basis of um, we may even want to put the caveat of there's been a limited amount of time yeah. even to gather the level of evidence in this important subject, but at least we're able to maximise out what we can get and put that on the record, at least in terms of the information. I think that, Chair, that's absolutely the caveat that needs to be very clear in the Bill report, that this was fast and it, it provides a, a, a body of evidence that then will be picked up subsequently. Um, the list of stakeholders, though, that you have covered in the... Um 
brief in yeah. there, like it covers all of the, the main stakeholders who you, you would imagine would want to, to input to it. And Peter, just I suppose, the in relation, and perhaps Riz will cover this anyway from their briefing, but the, the previous consultation that was done back in 2014, I assume, would be still very informative. Absolutely, yeah. That, that's still effectively what everyone's working off, because you recall that that was what informed the suggestion that zero hours would be incorporated in the 2016 employment bill, employment law as it was then, but we again hit the buffers in terms of a dissolution and because work still had to be done to get the rest of the bill through, it was lifted out. Um, but that's still the most substantial piece of work that's been done on it. Obviously, as well as going direct and, and targeting specific stakeholders, we'll do our sadly very, very short survey on citizen space that we really only can manage three weeks and that's really pushing it to get the, the evidence uh, reported on but it will give us an indication of views that are out there but again that'll be very heavily caveated okay so just going to ask the members agreement to a couple of, of things then um that first of all in relation to seek the extension of the committee stage um, that we would table the following motion that in accordance with standing order 33 for the period referred to in standing order 33 to be extended to the 21st of March 2022 in relation to the committee stage the employment zero hours workers and banded weekly, weekly working hours bill so are members happy enough with that mm -hmm. Thank you. that we would request a briefing paper from Reyes on the bill Thank you. <coughs> that we write to the department to ascertain their views on the bill Yep. Um, and also to advise members that although there are no delegated powers memorandum in relation to a private member's bill, the bill will still need to be referred to the examiner of statutory rules for advice in relation to delegated powers. Yep. So we'll do that. Um, the committee is proposing, or sorry, we are proposing that the committee initially writes to the stakeholders to seek written submissions on the bill. And those are listed NIGIC2, Unite, Unison, CIPD, Women's Regional Consortium, the Women's Regional Policy Group, um, Federation of Small Businesses, Retail NI, Hospitality, Ulster, Hotels Federation, NICVA, NILGA, and the Labour Relations Agency. And just to also advise members that FSB, Hotels Federation, Hospitality, Ulster, and Retail NI have been invited to give oral evidence to the committee next week. Go ahead, Mike. Well, what about the Ulster Farmers Union? Yes, because we did. We talked about that. We we we'll add them as a specific um, a seasonal request. Yeah, no problem. Um, the committee will also carry out our wider public consultation via a survey on citizen space. The draft survey questions are page sixty-eight of table papers. And aware, obviously, members will have received that yesterday afternoon and may have been involved in the climate debate. So, if, if they want to um, fire through any suggestions here before. Yeah, absolutely. We won't publish that again until probably. Okay, we will reflect on that later in terms of practicalities. Um, we have to go through a process to make those live. Uh, so, if members want to have a look at those, Anything that strikes you, if you can come back to us as soon as possible, we will <coughs> let you know um, approximately when we're likely to go live with those. So if you can let us know before that, um, that would be great. Um, the, the survey questions are, are very much similar to what the consultation was previously. Um, so we, we've not really gone off beam with that. And again, because we have such a short turnaround. So are members content that the questions or if those are amendments, but those would be put out for the survey? Okay. Can we include the ABBA on the list as well? Yeah. Along with the EFU? Yeah, please. Mm. Chair, maybe, maybe just to take that point, I mean, I've, I've no problem with any of the suggestions. Whether we can also maybe just give a bit of thought if anybody occurs, say, within the next week, if Absolutely. there's any additional yeah. organisation Absolutely, we, we have a bit of time. I'm just time. conscious we may be leaving and then suddenly oh. pops into our head, somebody head tomorrow that such and such should be on the list as well. We'll also, um, once we've got the survey up, um, comms will, will push out via social media. They have a thing they can do that, that works out who to target. I don't know how it works, but it seems very, very clever and efficient. 
Um, but if members have any other groups they think would be useful to get a specific written response from, if you let us know as soon as you can. Okay. I know, but the students' union might also be a useful yeah. one in terms of because a lot of students will be involved in that yeah, sort of yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so just to, oh, and I've lost my place now, yeah, um, also just to seek members' agreement to um, issue the call for evidence notice. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's. That's that, Peter, in relation to the zero hours. It is. I'm just taking the opportunity at this point, Chair, to highlight to members that the um, fracking bill will be getting its second stage on Tuesday, I think. Yeah. Um, normally, our practice would be to do a pre-second stage briefing. This has crept up and surprised us. So we haven't had the opportunity to have Anya Murphy in to talk to us about that, which means we don't really have um, an awful lot for you to say as chair going into that second stage. It's not an ideal situation for us. Although we can reflect that we did do the meetings previously. Yeah. Um, we did previously ask the then minister about. Well, we, ha we, have all so that, we have, we have a... all that background. And Chair, that, that's another thing I wanted to, to indicate to members. This bill, um, I think literally, the if it goes through on Tuesday, the 30 days for a committee report end the day before dissolution. So I'm going to inquire if there's a such a thing as extending beyond the end of the mandate. I suspect not. So it'll be really very, very tight if we can even publish uh, a committee report because, you know, in, in no way would we ever imagine we can turn around a report in the 30 days, but we can at least push out the evidence we have. As we get it, we will, we will publish as much as we possibly can. Um, but it's also, I suppose, to ask the chair and, and committee if, because we have had the engagement with um, Fermanagh groups and so on, is if we can bank that so that we can then talk to other groups in the very short space of time we have. Um, it's so not ideal, because that was a good few months ago that we did that. Was it even pre-COVID? I can't remember. Might have been. No, I don't think it was pre-COVID. Oh, but, no. it, it, but I don't it, think it is. It is what it is. It just is. what it, well, the, the, the issues and the views are still the same. So we can reflect those. Actually, you're absolutely right. We can reflect sure, those in a, in a committee position. Just maybe make a more general point. It's not totally specific reference to this bill, but... I do have to say it's not. I don't think it's a particularly satisfactory way to be doing legislation. To be perfectly honest, on that on that regard, if if we're reaching a point where not only are things proceeding, which have no hope of reaching the statute books, but also actually we're going to have probably a relatively curtailed mm. opportunity for evidence gathering. You know, I, I would agree with that, Chair. I feel it's. I mean, it, it clearly, a hugely important issue, and something I care and many of my constituents do. And obviously, lots of constituents in places like Fermanagh are extremely, but it just feels a bit, um, uh, yeah, not entirely. But but procedurally, Peter, procedurally, it passes to us. Yeah, it, it, it's referred, the, the, the referral is automatic the day after. And, and I suppose what it really highlights is that, and, and this is, I suppose I'm going on a solo run by saying this. Um, it really highlights the issue around the 30 day, 30 working day um, period for a committee report in statute. Now, routinely, in 99.9 in .9 of cases, we extend that. But because it says 30 days in law, that bill can still come and, and still expect a committee bill report. If that 30 days wasn't 30 days, you could automatically point to that and say, well, there's no point in that bill coming because you, you, the committee report stage doesn't can't be confined within that. It's it's a, it's an issue that again will be. I have no doubt one of the many discussion points we have in dissolution. Can I just say, as a point of fact, Clark, would it not have been possible to schedule that for second reading? Would had it been any closer to the date of dissolution? No, but I still suspect that is going to happen because we still have won mm -hmm. the trade union bill that has had f introduction and. Mm. Introduced, I think, the same day, day uh, as fracking. Uh, was it? Was it zero hours? No it, it was certainly the same same day as one of the ones that is is getting to second stage. So, I I'm I'm not I'm not in a position to state what 
the criteria is anymore? Uh, the, the business committee prioritises executive okay. legislation, committee business, private members' bills, and then private members' business. So if there's space on the order paper, uh, I'm not speaking on behalf of the business committee, I'm just giving you an insight into the business committee. If there's space on the order paper and a private member's bill is on the top of the list, it'll go on the order paper. So that, would, that would be, it would take precedence over like mem motions yes, and things like uh, that. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Chair, I suppose the other thing to reflect on is the sheer weight of business going through plenary and the impact that will now have on committee. Wednesdays on committee day because it's flowing over. And we've been very lucky today that we, we have quorum, but I would have concerns about being able to do the work that committee needs to do and also um, maintain quorum and, and be able to support everything that goes on in the chamber because we are under instruction that the business in plenary is absolute precedence. So committee business falls behind that. Um, so if, if we lose quorum, we lose quorum. But it is just something to reflect on and just something for members to be aware of in terms of you know their involvement in that maybe Wednesday morning plenary. And obviously picking up again on what um, Mr. Weird suggested for the session with Sir Michael, is maybe doing that a bit earlier, doing it about half nine so that we don't lose anyone. Um, it's maybe something we, we kind of need to have a bit more thought about as well. We, we see how that develops, Chair, but I, I just would flag up that it, it will complicate um, what we can do with the legislation that's coming. Okay, well, sure, we can play it by ear. We have a, we have a template and a process, which we will always launch no matter what comes our way, but I think it's important, as members have said, that things are appropriately caveated. Whatever we're publishing yeah. needs to be appropriately caveated. Okay. We'll move on then to item number nine, which is correspondence. Um, 9.1 is correspondence from the Department to the Committee for Education at page 124 regarding the Period Products Free Provision Bill. So that's for members to note, but it's quite a comprehensive um, response. 9.2 then is correspondence from the Executive Office regarding the announcement of the launch for the publication on the draft investment strategy, page 136. The consultation will last 12 weeks, putting it beyond the end of this mandate. It will be for this committee's successor to engage then on the draft st strategy. So that's for members to note as well. There is correspondence from the chair of the protocol subcommittee to Bayes, uh, page 216, regarding cosmetic products. So again, for members to note. Correspondence then 9.4 from the chair of the protocol subcommittee to the Minister for Trade Policy at page 217 regarding a generalised scheme of tariff preferences. So again, to note, there is correspondence um, from an individual, page 218, regarding exclusion from the rollout of fibrous broadband to the rural community. The committee has already requested a briefing updating members on Project Stratum, so if members note that for now and we can revisit when we get the briefing. Then 9.6, draft regulations, the domestic abuse information sharing with schools, etc. regulations, NI 2022, that's at page 274, so that's for members to note. 9.7, then there's correspondence from the DALO regarding the SL1 on um, those regulations at page 82 of table papers. It advises that the, the, these regulations um, enables the Department of Justice to bring forward regulations to provide for an Operation Encompass model for Northern Ireland. Operation Encompass is an early intervention partnership between schools and the police, enabling support for children and young people who are experiencing domestic abuse. And it's been agreed that the Department of Education will lead with, with responsibility for a rollout of in, Operation Encompass with support from DFE around operations relating to FE colleges and private training providers who deliver DFE funded vocational training and partnerships. A note in the media this morning that this scheme has been expanded. Uh, and maybe a, a pilot of this scheme perhaps is expanded. Yeah. I wasn't sure if there was any colleges uh, or training centres involved in it, was there? Well, there, there, there should be. That's, that's the understanding that we have, is that it'll be... Um, It'll be part of the age-appropriate targeting. But in the pilot, were there? Yeah, I, I wasn't clear question. from the... I only heard the median stories, I'm not sure. We could 
we'll seek clarification mm. on that because I assume there would be at least one of each, eight, an FE college or at least a campus yeah. and at least one private provider, but we'll check on that um, um, just to be sure. It, that would make sense if, to do the pilot across all spectrum, yeah. just see if there's any issues. Okay. Moving on then to 9.8, there's correspondence from the Committee for Justice regarding the SL1, the Insolvency Amendment Rules, NA 2022, at page 84 of Table Papers. Um, the Committee for Justice noted that the Insolvency Service, which is a branch of DFE, is responsible for insolvency policy. However, the Department of Justice has responsibility under Article 359 of the Insolvency Northern Ireland Order 1989 for making the rules governing insolvency procedure with the concurrence of DFE, the committee therefore agreed to seek the views of the Committee for the Economy on the proposed statutory rule. So um, if members are happy to correspond back to the Committee for Justice indicating that we have no objection to the rule. Is there anything you want to add to that? No, Chair, it, it is a very sort of much as it says on the tin um, thing and it, it would be, um, it's, it aligns with all of the other insolvency things we've discussed earlier on today so the, the committee's already aware of that policy and this fits right into that um, therefore you know it, it makes sense to support the, the statutory rule to complete the picture if you like. 9.9 yeah. .9 then is a response from Connor Burns MP Minister of State at the NIO to the committee at page 91 of table papers regarding the issues faced by the three airports here and acknowledging members' concerns. The Minister also highlights the work by the British Government around levelling up mm -hmm. that will support the Norse connectivity to Britain. So if members are happy enough that in the first instance anyway we would share that response with the three airports. Chair, the, the other thing I suppose to highlight is today's the day, I think, that the levelling up white papers published. But I don't. I'm not. I haven't kept a check to see if it's actually come out yet. But uh, as you asked, that chair was literally on the website of the Deluxe website, and I don't. I can't see a link to it. Oh, I don't yeah, know. No. There's, it's in order now to propose we write for the department's view of the what they're living up by. Because we, chair, this is where it becomes complex. Yeah, just to note that the the minister for finance gave a pretty broad hint that rates relief mm -hmm. will continue in the next financial year. Mm -hmm. In uh, question time, there's, uh, I, I think there's been a fair amount of um, staged. I can't think of a better word than leaking. So the newspapers over the last week, the media over the last week, I still call them the newspapers, um, as indicated, there'll be twelve specific areas that are going to be, you know, policy priorities that are potentially going to be legislated for. Um, I'm wondering, are they? looking at probably, I don't know, publishing later on in the day, because it was PM, PMQs today? Today, what's today, Wednesday? So I, I don't know, they might publish that, who knows. Um, but we already have some outstanding correspondence on this. Yes. Um, that will probably now be delayed, because we've written to people asking about levelling up, and I suppose now they'll be able to reflect something. So. If members are content, we'll bring it to next week's meeting okay. uh, so that members can have a bit of a look at it and, and <laughs> it reinforce the correspondence that's already been out uh, about how these funds are going to have, particularly we've written around, obviously, ESF, uh, match funding and so on. Um, it'll, it'll give members an opportunity to see if, well, if that correspondence now needs to be reconsidered, updated or whatever. Um, and we'll, if members are content, we'll make it an item next okay. week on the agenda. Okay, so moving on then, 9.10, there's correspondence from the British Minister for Trade Policy, Penny Mordaunt, MP, to the Chair of the Protocol Subcommittee at page 93 regarding a generalised scheme of tariff preferences, so that's for members to note. At 9.11, then there's correspondence from BES to the Chair of the Protocol Subcommittee at page 95 of Table Papers regarding cosmetic products, again for members to note. And then 9.12 is the Investment Strategy NI Delivery Tracking System Investing Activity Report. So that's page 97 of Table Papers and is for members to note. And then 9.13 is the Examiner of Statutory Rules 11th Report of the Session 2021-22. to 
at page 101 of table papers. So again, for members to note. <clears throat> so we're going to move now to item number 12, which is the consultation relief for energy intensive industries, EIIS, from the indirect costs of the Northern Ireland Renewable Obligations, Renewables Obligation. Um, so there is a DFE briefing paper, Relief for Energy Intensive Industries from Indirect Costs of the NIRO at page 109 of Table Papers, and then the consultation on the same at page 112 of Table Papers, just to advise members that the information in these documents is restricted and should not be shared. Um, so we're not that for now, Peter. Just for now, um, until we can talk a bit more about the consultation itself. Um, obviously, this will have impacts around all of the issues that are currently going on about um, energy prices, the level of subsidy and so on, but also feeds into the energy strategy, the energy action plan and so on. There's a lot to unpack there, um, but it's just at the minute we're not able to talk about it openly because it's it's still being um, finalised before publication. Um, but it is something really we, we would need to be coming back to um, and we will have to find a way to schedule that with everything else that's happening. But it will it will need to be done because there needs to be some reflection on all of that bigger picture around the energy strategy and so on before the solution so that we have something we can recommend to the successor committee in the legacy report. Um, we find a way, Chair. It does say, I assume I'm allowed to say this, that the energy officials are available to discuss the consultation. So... And once, once it's de-restricted, as it were, um, we'll bring them in and we, we try and plan a, a wider useful session around the energy strategy, action plan and so on and how this all works together. Okay. Um, because there's a lot and also the impact that obviously the climate change bills and so on are going to have. It's a massive area to kind of draw together. Yep. Okay. So moving back then to item number 10, which is any other business and... Chair, this is just a thing that has occurred to me, um, and it was because we, we got the uh, zero hours contract bill when we weren't necessarily expecting it. <coughs> um, another role that I hold is clerk to the Youth Assembly, and the Youth Assembly is very keen to give an input. Obviously, a lot of young people are... Zero hours is relevant to them. You know, a lot of them work in hospitality, all sorts of other... Um, you know, part-time jobs and so on. So it was really just to get the committee's um, approval to seek ways where we can bring the Youth Assembly views into the committee for the committee's bill report and, and to be able to engage. Um, we will logistically work out how we do that, but they are super keen to get their hands on that bill. Okay. Yeah. If that's okay. That. Yeah. Go ahead, Claire. Um, sorry, I, I didn't notify you of um, this, um, and I'm not sure there's any value particularly for this committee in relation to this, but um, rising gas prices. Mm -hmm. um, it appeared in the news again today, and they talked about these gr the, these rises potentially last two to three years. Emergency fuel payments, even if they do get them out quicker, um, are not going to support people for that length of time. I also have a particular concern around middle-income families who are not eligible for the support, but cannot afford these cost of living <coughs> I don't know what we do from a from a gas perspective. Some people have suggested, because it, it is a global um, issue, but then some people are suggesting they corner the market. Therefore, you know, would competition help this? I don't know. I just think maybe given that it's fuel, there is impacts for perhaps the Department for the Communities and their kind of welfare bit around it. But Chair, you recall there's the uh, group of four, DFE, DFC, the Utility Regulator and Consumer Council. Council are working together on this. Now, we, we have a, an unscheduled but an understanding with the utility regulator that we're going to bring them in once they've completed their work around the SUNY governance, but we'd also intended to get them in. You recall um, the, the re regulator briefed the committee a couple of times before on this uh, to sort of get a, an idea of where we are because obviously a few months has passed. We're now into the new year and they might have more idea of just how long-lasting this could be because there was some lack of clarity. Um, so we will attempt to schedule the utility regulator who can give us background on what's going on across that group of four. Yeah, and we also previously wrote 
to the department and potentially to the British ministers as well on this. We did, we in did. In relation to the VAT yeah. issues and the windfall tax issues. And we, we got a, <clears throat> a response that said effectively no. Um, no. Although I think there potentially could be moves in Westminster around the VAT issue in particular. I think that's the other issue is obviously this falls under this levelling up agenda so we don't know whether there's going to be bigger um, things like that dealt with at that level. I know there's been a lot of speculation around looking at energy prices that squeeze not just on the most, uh, those who, who suffer fuel poverty the most, but also you know the, the price rises have been such that they're climbing up the socioeconomic scale. Now there's a lot of um, people who earn you know, good salaries are finding that the rises are huge and it's, it's causing a lot of problems, that whole cost of living rise. Yeah. And there was a question when we previously, I think, discussed this with the utility regulator around the 2% profit. Well, as prices go up, yeah. that profit margin potentially goes grows. up yeah. significantly as well. So potentially there's something in terms of regulation that should be looked at there. And that, that's a, the, the position, how the position's different here, where there is a, a price structure where that doesn't exist, certainly in England. Or anywhere, else, um, or in anywhere else, and yeah, so we have all that to sort of think about, and we will try and get a briefing. Yeah, well, I accept this is an international problem or an international issue because there's no doubt in my mind somebody's making a huge profit somewhere out of this. Uh, I, I think we need to fully explore is utility regulator using their powers to the full. Uh, we need to continue to raise voices around the issue of. Uh, windfall taxes and VAT and all those sorts of things because it is, as has been said, impacting not only on low income but middle income families who can't afford to fully heat their homes or heat their homes at all. And I, I'm getting a wee bit weary of uh, the excuses and the reasons we're being constantly given on the media as to why uh, this is occurring. There's profits being made. They need to be uh, redistributed or kept to ensure that families can have the basic privilege or basic right to heat their home. And I know this economy committee has limited powers, but I think we need to really raise our voices on this one. And the, um, the issue around the regulation, I think, is one we can look it at in more chair. detail. The, um, the fact is other countries across Europe have already taken some of the actions the cut in the VAT, the energy surcharges, the, the windfall tax that they then put to fuel poverty measures. So those are things that um, practically can, can already be done. Um, we just haven't seen any of that happening yet. And Jared, it's probably worth remembering too that um, a redesign of the regulator is our expectation from legislation coming through on the back of the energy strategy. That was always what was discussed, it's been discussed with the regulator, the regulator knows what they want, also changes to the role and operation of the Consumer Council as well. Those are, are things that require legislation. Um, there's areas of, of regulation that simply don't happen. Obviously, um, oil, you know, fuel oil isn't, mm -hmm. isn't regulated at all, and that's still a huge um, source of fuel here. Obviously, mm -hmm. you know, going towards net zero, that's going to have to change. But, that's not regulated and it doesn't fall within the utility regulator. Also LPG as well. Yeah, there, there's, those aren't subject to the exponential no, rises no, that we're absolutely. seeing in classes, um, why they are going up. I think it's worthwhile getting that briefing with the utility regulator just to, I think they probably have, a, have an idea of anything that's going on. They'll obviously be party to any discussions. Um, but obviously we are getting to that point in the end of the financial year where there is money at the centre and I suppose it's really it's down to the committee as to what they want to ask for. And well, uh, and, and first, uh, uh, the utility regulator, I'm not really keen to have a tea and sympathy session with the utility regulator. No, no. Um, I want to hear what he can do, not what he yeah. can't do. And uh, a full exploration of his current powers because uh, it's beyond now us getting a report on what the gas markets are looking like. It's what can you do about it? I think, if I'm here. I think Chair, it's not unreasonable to ask the utility regulator for some kind of template of how they see the legislation being. I don't know if any members were involved in the legislation that the OFM DFM committee brought through on the 
reform and, and change of the NIPSO office. Mm. Like that that was driven by the NIPSO. He remember that that was driven by the NIPSO office. Like that that would be your expectation that they know best what powers they need, and then the department will work in tandem with them. So I don't think it's unreasonable to to seek a template from the utility regulator of how they feel their powers need to be changed so that that can start to be discussed so that legislation can be rolled forward. I think being able to ask for specifics like that would, would be particularly useful and would also be something that you, you might want to be able to reflect in a legacy report so the new committee can get up and run with it quickly. Um, because energy legislation needs to come fairly fast and, and we don't really have a... I suppose we don't really have an understanding of what is coming and what the likely timescales are. So it might just be worthwhile getting that kind of information um, and starting that conversation. Um, if members are content, we'll, we'll engage with the utility regulator to see what might be possible around something like that. Um, because as Mr O'Dowd said, that, that's what is coming and, and it, it may as well be a conversation that's started now. Um. Chair, can I add as well, just in the spirit of cross-departmental working and perhaps cross-party working, um, should we maybe even write to the committee for the uh, communities just in relation to the welfare aspect of this? I am mindful that there was a, a government programme, a housing executive programme, that really did encourage people to go toward gas. Um, and those people are now finding themselves in great difficulty because of that. And I think just fr from a kind of wider consideration... Um, you know, is, is that something they, they need to be aware of before deciding these types of schemes that are actually putting people into more difficulties? I, I, I don't know. I just, um, you know, that a lot of the messages that I'm receiving is, as oh, you know, we, we, we couldn't wait to get it in. Now we would be nearly keen to get it out just because of the prices. And I appreciate, appreciate that won't be a long-term necessarily um, consideration, but it certainly is in the short term, and it's, it's critical now. You know, the, the warnings that we heard last September are now finding their way on the ground to people and they've, they've gotten their letters to say that, you know, your, your costs are rising quite significantly and um, I'm inundated with messages, what can we do? And, and sadly, I, I, there's very little I feel I can do, um, but other than raise it here and, and another form. Okay, so moving on to item 7. Time and place of our next meeting is next Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. in room 29, Peter. Next door. Yes, next door. It's our short meeting, Chair. Thank, Thank you. you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room.